evening everybody and welcome to my talk eating away the last wildlife species is Nigeria facing a bushmeat crisis may I warn that some photos may be disturbing in this presentation therefore viewer discretion is advised for this lecture or talk today I want to borrow from the theme for 2021 World Wildlife Day, which reads, Forests and Livelihoods, Sustaining People and Planet, which auspiciously captures the essence of my talk today. I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity and privilege to speak today. As an introduction, let me tell us that bushmeat has been variously described by various authors as the meat of wild animals, hunted or captured by local people for income or subsistence within the West and Central African part of the world. Well, as we all know, bushmeat is consumed in other parts of the world. For example, we are familiar with the Chinese and their culture of eating wild meat. The persistent indiscriminate harvest of wild meat in Nigeria has become a matter of global concern. Unsustainable levels of hunting and harvest are believed to threaten the survival of diverse species around West and Central Africa and particularly in Nigeria because of the large population and a culture whereby every moving animal is a target. The aim and objectives of my talk today is to highlight the importance of recognizing the fact that recent widespread bushmeat consumption could be a poverty dependent, ignorance or cultural, religious driven issue with several consumer communities, which is catalyzed by corruption and an ailing economy. It also attempts to investigate trends, types of species consumed, sources, and it's also researching about the drivers, potential deterrents, and possible substitutes for bushmeat among consumer communities in my country. At the end of the day, I would like to make recommendations for sustainable wildlife conservation in Nigeria. As we all know, Nigeria is a big country with seven national parks, many game reserves, at least on paper. We have other categories of conservation areas, such as the wildlife sanctuaries and a strict nature reserve. We have different ecological zones and as such a wide array of biodiversity. Up north we have the Chad Basin National Park. Close to my area we have the Cross River National Park. And in the northeast we have the Gashaka Gumti National Park. Then coming down south we have the Kanji Lake National Park. In the North Central, the Kamuku National Park. Then in the Middle Belt, we have Okomu National Park. We also have in the Southwest, Old Oyo National Park. These parks were previously eight in numbers, but one of them, the famous Nyankari National Park, 
later became a game reserve. So we have today seven national parks and the present regime has just recently earmarked additional 10 national parks which will be constituted into law and put under protection. Hopefully this will enhance the protection of our biodiversity at various places. Nigeria itself is a biodiversity hotspot. The region falls within the Guinean forest of West Africa, which itself is a global biodiversity hotspot. Many ecological islands exist in Nigeria with rich biodiversity, and some of such are yet to be scientifically documented. And those that have so far been documented, many of them are not receiving adequate protection. Many of them are now terrorists, safe heavens, bandits, insurgents, militants, kidnappers, and other unscrupulous persons. These have made it impossible for the sustainable conservation of our species and their habitats. So we have a number of aquatic terrestrial Arboreal and transitional ecosystems. We have in the hinterlands a number of lakes of global conservation importance. We have the Hadeji and Guru Lake, a wintering wetland spot for migrant birds. We have Oguta Lake with African manatees. We have Nikkei Lake, a tourist de a destination in Enugu State. We have Agulu Lake, a crocodile hotspot in Anambra State. We have many other important localities that have not been put under protection. The big question remains, where are the species? I want to re-emphasize that Nigeria is particularly rich in wildlife. Our biodiversity spreads across the different ecological zones, from the semi-arid areas, the Sahel, uh, areas of Nigeria to the savannah belt, the different components of the savannah belt, the island places, the plateau, all the way down to the transition zones, the rainforest zones, and the estuaries with the mangrove forest different species abound and almost every other local government area of Nigeria has the potential to boast of one or two or even more species of global conservation importance. But what are we doing with them? How are we harnessing them? So currently there are about 7,895 plant species identified in 338 families and 2,215 genera as well as 22,000 vertebrates and invertebrate species. 
that include, conservatively speaking, 20,000 insect species, 1,000 birds, 1,000 fishes, 247 mammals, and 123 reptiles. We cannot say exactly, but at this moment I can't say exactly the number of amphibians in Nigeria, but conservatively we have over 40 species of amphibians recognized. And I have personally collected additional six species yet to be classified and identified in science. But it will be of great interest to state here that about 0.14% of these species are threatened at various levels, while 0.22% are endangered. And this is as far back as the year 2001, based on the first National Biodiversity Report. Subsequent reports has shown that the animals are facing increasing threats and their numbers declining. Some animals are hanging on the brink. You will see from the picture on my left side of the screen a collection of different species of tortoises seized from a single trader in a market a bushmeat market in uyo the capital of my state on the second photograph this is a typical scenario any day any time you a keen observer travels through Portacot Patani to Wari Highway. You will see hundreds of freshwater tortoises, the Pelusius nigger, hanging upside down, with Pelusius castaneus. All these species are traded openly on the roadside hanging upside down in the most horrible fashion all day long, irrespective of the weather. Suko can only come when they are bought. Suko can only come when they die. So, at the rate at which these animals are harvested and traded, for instance, the homes hinge back tortoise at the bottom of the picture on the left that looks slightly whitish in color compared to the black tortoises. These tortoises are captured and traded in large numbers because of a charm that is produced with the meat of this animal. The charm is a love portion that women who need to have certain men they have to feed this meat or charm in their food and when they eat they succumb to the woman's control and never look back and so for women who were looking for white men they have to use the whitish tortoise and the women looking for black men will use the black tortoises. And this trade and use of the charm, we are not sure if it ever works. But roadside knowledge, common knowledge, has made people to persistently hunt this animal to feed the love portion market. This is what we discovered when the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund gave us a grant to work on a community-based conservation of tortoises. 
in Cross River and Akwaibom State of Nigeria. I would like to give a brief background to the bushmeat consumption in Nigeria. This will help us to understand some of the issues and why the trend is so persistent. In the early 70s, shortly after the Civil War, many communities depended extensively on the forest for almost every human need. For example, food, such as wild vegetables, fruits, and animal protein. Medicines and foil wood, including timber for the post-war reconstruction, among other things. Poor community members had neither jobs nor income, and the rainforest became their banks, hospitals, insurance houses, and sources of livelihoods. People who had domestic animals hardly sold or slaughtered them except on rare and exceptional circumstances. Such animals were banged alive for the rainy days. So you will see a man with hundreds of domestic animals, but he wouldn't sell them out unless he had an occasion to trade them to make a particular money, maybe send a child to school. We had such cultures whereby they used such domestic animals to settle fines imposed at the end of legal cases. The traditional legal practice then placed sanctions of people, fines and so on. Such may include, depending on the crime, or the case in question. Somebody may be found, I mean, given a fine of a cattle or more, a goat, a sheep, or a chicken. Cases are bound in my own neighborhood where I grew up, where a woman who mistakenly or cannot give an account of the gizzard of a chicken that she cooked in the pot for the family. She couldn't give account of it because the gi I mean, perhaps somebody ate it by mistake. The gizzard was the strict preserve of the head of the household, the husband. And if she couldn't present it, the matter would be taken up. Her in-laws will come in, the community will come in, and a fine of a full chicken will be imposed on her. So she has to go and buy a chicken and slaughter afresh. People had to do traditional marriages and depending on the community, depending on the status of the woman you are marrying, a princess you may have to give a cattle or a bull. And in my community, lots of people married giving he goats. You had to find a matured goat to take a wife. I did that when I was marrying Fonobong. So today, you had situations whereby what we are enjoying today, what my children are enjoying today, eating meat anyhow, every day, never existed when I was growing up. People who had domestic animals hardly sold them or slaughtered them. Except on those rare or on an exceptional circumstances. Such animals were banked only for the rainy days. I was born on the 1st of October 1969. In the midst of the Nigerian Civil War. Sick and malnourished. In the dick Tick of the rainforest where my mother gave birth to me, which is the reason I named her the Incredible Lioness, for bearing the pain, taking all the risk to keep a crying baby malnourished with kwashoko. When other women were asking her, throw him away, 
abandon him to die. When the war is over, you will certainly have another baby. But she refused. She kept her demonian. And she survived the war. So as a child growing up, I had no access to meat. Didn't have the luxury of eating meat as my children eat today and other children in Nigeria. So in the photograph here, you will see the young boys of a chairman from in Volta Lake of Ghana. Keeping manatee skulls that they cherish so much. Because in Africa and in Nigeria, in lots of communities, once a person kills a large animal, the person is likely to keep a part of it as a souvenir to remember. It could be the horns, it could be the skin, it could be the skulls and other uh, cherished parts. So, throughout that era, hunting of wild animals became the means to survival. Wildlife and things of the forest were free gifts of nature according to the people and they were captured at liberty. They killed and traded in them and that covers whatever species they could find. There were no restrictions on what people could catch or kill. With limited human population, vast forest areas, a modest stroke subsistence hunting efficiency at that time, not many persons worried about the species and what was happening to them. But with a rapidly expanding human population, more pressure mounted on all fronts. An urbanization and globalization struck the resources of the world. And then came the commercialization of bush made on thing, the pet trade, the zoo-related captures for both domestic and export markets. So in order to bring up this talk, I employed varied methods, dex reviews, field surveys, bushmeat market surveys, including clandestine bushmeat surveys, contact visits, including training and focal groups, use of informants, community engagement and poaching campaigns, Schools, conservation and education clubs, wildlife theater, drama and dance. Today, we have the Al Capella group, which sings in order to convey serious wildlife conservation messages to our people. The culture, tradition and origins of consumption I must say this, and taking myself, my own experience, as a child growing up in my village, meat eating was a big luxury. A child who ate eggs was considered a thief or a criminal in embryo, somebody that they consider that he will certainly grow up to be an arm robber or a failure in society. Only elders and grown-ups who had money could have, I mean, be seen qualified to eat meat. Domestic animals, such as cattle, sheep, goats, chicken, were only served on festive days. For example, Christmas, New Year Day, Easter, marriages, birthdays in rich families. Lucky families of hunters had occasional access to meat from the wild when a subsistent hunter killed an animal. Those who were who killed larger or dangerous animals were celebrated and revered. They were given titles. Some took new wives for being the killer of the hippopotamus, for being the lion killer. The man who killed the last leopard in my region of the country, that was on a voodoo cattle ranch. He was given a chieftaincy uh, title and honored. So only taboos in a few communities and cultures kept a few species from being hunted or killed. 
Whereas trees were better protected in a couple of places, in shrines and evil forests. And in forest reserves by government. The animals rarely had any such protection, which led to their wanton destruction in many places. So men who killed big animals, like the python in this picture, were considered heroes of South. We have men answering such title as killer of lion, conqueror of the crocodile, master of the forest. And so I was Christian, Obongi Kot, or king of the forest, when at the age of nine, I captured a very big python in my trap and brought it to the village. So from 1977 to 1979, I was a famous boy hunter and I captured many animals. Not until one day in the year 1981, a late kinsman, Elder Ekpenyong Ekpenyong, took me to the zoo in Joss Plateau, where I encountered the dancing chimpanzee. And then I recalled when Mr. Ebuk, a.k.a. Obam Bam Bam, a kinsman took me to a hunting expedition in Oban. And he found a live chimpanzee, a young one, in a trap. And he used his machete instead of the gun to hit the chimp to death. The agony of that chimp crying and dying reverberated in my mind when I saw the dancing chimp. And from that day I made up my mind, I will never hunt again. My thinking, perception of the animals changed from that day onwards. Whereas people nowadays, and even in those days, they still hunt wild animals as bushmeat and with pride. So 1970s to 1980s, bushmeat consumption was and still is an elitist affair because the average bushmeat per kilo is much more expensive than the domestic meat. 1986 to 1982, bushmeat consumption was still in vogue. So I went to the university when bushmeat trade and consumption was very much acceptable. Our lecturers taught us about rogue animals that hunters were allowed to hunt by paying some ticket monies into government purses. African manatees were hunted for destroying fishing gear and nets, hippos and elephants for crop raiding, leopards and crocodiles were considered rogue for attacking humans, pythons for killing people. A big tax ensued to regulate and a few animals were hunted even to the brink of their local extinction. Today we cannot see a leopard in some areas of Nigeria any longer. We are not even sure if wild dogs still exist in Nigeria. The likelihood of meeting a bushmeat joint or bushmeat traded openly on major highways and roads as well as in open markets is very, very common. From 1993 to 1996 came a big and strong conservation awareness against bushmeat trade. The Bushmeat Crisis Tax Force expanded their campaigns to Nigeria. They encouraged people like me. NGOs made effort to disc uh, discourage you over exploitation of wildlife. National parks intensified the anti-poaching campaigns. The Drill Ranch Calabar, Sekopan, Primary Preservation Group led by N.S. Wufo, 
And today, that group is what we now have as Biodiversity uh, Preservation Center, which took serious steps to combat the trend in the Cross River region, while the Nigerian Conservation Foundation took charge of numerous hotspots in the nation, campaigning against the trade in bushmeat. Bushmeat and illegal trade exist in the U.S. As Hida Eves would report, bushmeat is also in Europe. For example, when experts checked an Air France flight from Central and West Africa that landed at Paris, over a 17-day period in 2008, of 134 people searched, nine had bushmeat and 83 livestock or fish. One passenger had 51 kilograms of bushmeat and no other luggage. Most of the bushmeat were smoked and had arrived at dry, as dried carcasses. Some animals were identifiable. Experts found 11 types of bushmeat, including monkeys, large rats, crocodiles, small antelopes and pangolins, even ant eaters. Almost 40% were listed on the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES. Today we have serious cross-border issues. Bushmeat and other forest resources flow intermittently into Nigeria from the Cameroons, Bioko, and Central Africa. The neighboring countries are also at risk because the Nigerian bushmeat crisis is like a wildfire, raising down the mountain towards the lowlands. Nigeria, which has over 200 million people, and the bulk of this population has no means of livelihood, and the forests and its resources remain their last hope for survival in a failing economic situation. So the huge bushmeat market in Nigeria is a fertile ground for more and more wildlife from neighboring countries. Our porous borders are also a good opportunity for cross-border trade. The insurgency, banditry, militancy, kidnapping, and Boko Haram all serve as catalysts accelerating the crisis. Thanks to Cross River National Park Nigeria, Evangelist Kalaran Olori and our team, as you see on the picture there with the president of BPC Nigeria and myself with the white cap behind, we've worked extensively to checkmate the bushmeat crisis coming in from the southwest Cameroon region. Up north, you find mountains of smoked frogs in the open market. Many species are at risk, as is shown on that slide. Between 10,000 to 100,000 species globally are becoming extinct this year, according to, you know, scientific data. At the end of the day, 47,677 species in IUCN red data list of 2018, about 17,291 are deemed to be at serious risk. But 21% of mammals, 30% of amphibians, 12% of birds, 28% of reptiles, and even freshwater fishes, 37%. These are very at serious levels of risk. So are we eating away the last wildlife? Yes, of course. Take, for example, among the endangered primate species of Nigeria, 11 of them, two apes and nine monkeys, are under threat. With that in mind, I began to make contributions to save our species by publishing my research. And I want to be very, very grateful to the driving forces in my engine room. Professor Oates, Fabio Petrosi, and my twin brother, Professor Luca Luiselli of the University of Rome. Professor S.S. Ajayi, my mentor, Hida Eves and Nata Belli of BCTF USA, great supporters from within Nigeria, and Dr. Russell Midmer of Global Wildlife Conservation USA, who has been a motivator. The fulcrum has been people like my own father and my mom, 
the incredible lioness. Ernest Mufo, Susan Kingston, Hampshire. Where, where white people were busy killing the animals with impunity, killing almost the last elephants, massacring an entire colony of chimps, massacring crocodiles, their extermination on a daily basis, the pangolin markets in Nasarawa and elsewhere in Nigeria, all the kinds of species which are found in the Bushmen market, like the manatee calf on that bike, even marine mammals, whales, dolphins, which are not left out, the leatherback turtles, these endangered species are not spared. We have elephants, crocodiles, pythons, shellfishes, Igeria. You will find out that in many of the bushmeat centers, hundreds of dried carcasses are to be found everywhere. Snails, shrimps, crabs, prawns, bushmeat is on bikes, bicycles, wherever. Assorted in all the places that we have visited. So why do people crave so much bushmeat? Poverty, both in the mind and in the pocket, religious, cultural, hunger, tradition, juju animism, so many, illiteracy, and even the absence of deterrence. So how can we address and stem the trend? We have to do all the for listed, particularly we have to tackle and target the children. Adopt responsible leadership and good governance as a nation. Teach and target the children by all means. The campaign, Massive Conservation Awareness Drug Education, like you have seen on the wanted list. More species are still on the wanted list and we need to expand this process. That's why I'm really grateful to SGP Nigeria for funding our current Bushmeat surveys and other conservation initiatives. Thank you, SGP Nigeria. We have done rallies marking all the global important days towards mobilizing the youth to positive actions. Why does this matter? The loss of biodiversity is dangerous and consequences are immediate. And we know that biodiversity conservation provides substantial benefits to meet immediate human needs. There will be for few, I mean, fewer opportunities for livelihoods and better health. In the long term, it also means less income for rural communities, which are often already amongst the poorest on the earth. Our cultures will suffer. And where, what is the way forward? We have to provide economic and social benefits that will provide local communities incentive for habitat protection and even to protect the species. Provision of alternatives to bushmeat, e.g. grass cutter, domestication of some wildlife, and then ecotourism will make sense by creating much needed employment. The other solutions is to build on the provisions of CBD. Public awareness is needed. Let us embrace tourism at all levels. And in my conclusion and recommendation, we have to face what the theme for Wildlife Day of 2021 has propagated. We have to shift the paradigm. We have to foster the science, policy, and politics interface in Nigeria. We must embrace our regulatory agencies, such as the NESRIA and the National Park Service and their unit parks. We need to 
joined the coalition of biodiversity conservationists of Nigeria, this umbrella body has come to salvage and wade into the crisis among other environmental issues in Nigeria. Thank you to all the following organizations who have supported my endeavor for the last 25 years. Thank you for listening. Where are the monkeys? Yeah. Where are the parrots? Where are the crocodiles? And the manatee. Where are the dolphins that were swimming in the fair? Where are the elephants? Where are they? There are many diseases that are caused by bushmeat. Mm. They are real. They are so real. So you need to stop, 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 stop. 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 Corona, Ebola, antivirus, plus a fever, HIV. You need to stop, 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 stop. Our hunters, yeah, yeah, are killing the animals, killing the animals, yeah, every day. Oh, yeah. Need to stop, 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 stop. So we need conservation. We need sustainability. We need from the wise use of wild. So we need conservation. We need sustainability. So you gotta stop, 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 stop. So you need to stop, just stop, yeah. Stop, stop, killing the stop, killing the stop, killing the elephant. Stop, stop. So you gotta stop, 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 yeah. Stop, stop. Stop, 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 you need to stop, 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 stop killing the stop, animals, stop, 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 we need them, stop, stop, we need conservation, sustainability, life live from the wises of a wild life, we need Conservation, sustainability, livelihood from the wise use of a wild Thank you for the host and everybody that has made this possible for today. Going by the Nigeria country we have and where laws are not implemented, we have institutions and laws. But in this regard, I want to ask the presenter how we can enforce or put in motion effective laws to guide the use of this because may are saying that we shouldn't uh, eat uh, wildlife or unsustainably consume the wildlife without backing it by law and a sort of enforcement. Most of us are illiterate. I mean, those rural communities that have this forest where this wildlife live or use as their habitat. How do we get to them in terms of enlightenment? and laws being put in place to guide against over consuming or unsustainable use of this wildlife. He mentioned poverty. Yes, most Nigerians are poor. They reverse or take the forest they have and the wildlife they're in as their source of food. 
source of income, in some cases, marginal income. So now, how do we guide them and control this level, high level of poverty to ensure that they don't consume wildlife, particularly those of them that are on verge of uh, extinction? So that is my question to him or the advice. And I want the international community to help us with, I mean, empowering or synergizing with our government, this country, to put in place some laws, local laws, because the Nigerian system is weak when it comes to implementation of laws, particularly the one that concerns most of these natural resources that is not um, being taken into serious consideration. Thank you. Uh, he has made a very good point. At the stage we are in the country, we have an overwhelming problem of poverty in many of our rural areas. And these rural people, they live close to the forest. As I said in my presentation, the forest is our last hope for survival. And when we have this level of dependence on the natural resources, it far outstrips the biological capacity of the wildlife to meet such a pressure. We have tried the law. Evangelist Caroline Olori, she's in the house today. She is the conservator of the Cross River National Park. And in fact, the first female conservator of any park in the history of Nigeria and even West Africa. Now, she will agree with me that the law alone cannot suffice because one, the national park is such a large entity. It is not fenced, it's not protected uh, in all the square meters, limited manpower, limited facilities to do the enforcement of the law. And then a lot of issues with the legal system of the country. If we are happy that the animals within the park or other protected areas are safe within the law, what happens to the majority of the animals outside the protected areas? So we see that the best strategy is to educate, educate, and educate, especially the younger generation who have not attached themselves to consumption of bushmeat. Once we are able to capture this population and enrich their attitude towards wildlife, we will make a straight and positive way forward for our country. That's why we have the conservation education centers. We have the schools conservation club to bring the awareness to the children so that the generations after us will live in harmony like wildlife. I mean, like the people in the East Africa do to their wildlife. Dr. Daniel Wagmagene, who is in the house today from uh, Washington, Daniel will tell you that in Tigray region of Ethiopia and elsewhere in that country, they don't kill their animals for bushmeat. Other countries regulate, but we are not able to regulate. We need to educate both the public, the people in power, the government, and then embrace good governance as a way forward. My question to Professor Inyang was linked to Kennedy's. Um, question is, um, seeing that there's a failure on government side implementing the legislations and prosecutions of that, um, the question was actually what um, legislations are in place in Nigeria um, when it comes to conservation and how are they prosecuted? Seeing that there's a failure on government side, does this now fall on the private sector and conservation body, bodies to implement these um, legislation and see to that. 
And then my second question for him is, there was a huge drive, um, and it comes from talks um, from Dr. Cheryl as well, and last week's talk is the, um, the um, uh, protein, alternative protein schemes. I know there was a huge drive um, a few years ago where they actually farmed um, the African giant snail for a, a protein source. Is that still going? Um, is there alternative protein farms um, combating and seeing to the problem of protein fighting the bushmeat trade? The situation is uh, varied depending on the region of the country. We do have very serious organizations working within the country outside the government. At the national parks level, we have seven national parks. Aside from those national parks that have uh, this Boko Haram problem, insurgency, the parks like the Cross River National Park, Okomu National Park, Oloyo National Park, these are well protected to the extent to which they have the people's support and government's support. So in those areas, protection is ongoing. A lot of people have been arrested, a lot of anti-poaching activity going on. And for sure, those places are the last hope for the protection of our species. The Nigerian Conservation Foundation Lagos have been at the forefront in different parts of the country promoting the conservation of our species. We have a program called Key Biodiversity Areas Program, which is anchored by the NCF Lagos. I am a member of that national committee. And then the Coalition for Biodiversity Conservationists of Nigeria, which is a nascent umbrella body which includes government, NGOs, and individuals are working seriously at different levels in advocacy, in direct research, and conservation activities. So all hope is not lost as these organizations are forging ahead. Then the international donor organizations have also done quite a lot of work. For instance, the SGP Nigeria, the small grants program from the Global Environmental Facility. They are almost all over the country now in pockets of communities doing community-driven projects. That's how the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund came to the Biodiversity Center and enhanced us and our activities with the grant and today we are enjoying a grant from African Aquatic Conservation Fund through the Save the Manatee Club, which is strictly for manatee conservation and many others. So hope is not lost. We are doing the little that, I mean, we have the financial capacity and technical know-how to do. We can do more. That is why it is good for us to come to this stage in this LCA program to be able to bring to greater awareness of the African continent that there is a crisis in this region and we need help from outside and from within. Thank you very much. I hope that and submit the question. Prof, a nice presentation. Now, Prof, you're aware of the system we have in Nigeria. There's NESRIA that is supposed to be regulating and um, controlling biodiversity blips. And then there's a national park that is headed by a conservation general whose powers is only restricted to the parks. Meanwhile, we have all sorts of conservation atrocities taking place right across the country. Now, if you were to advise the government on how to restructure what we have, and then you have um, the situation of the um, CITES officer who does not have the power of arrest. Now, 
what advice will you give the system, the government in Abuja, to put in place so that their regulatory bodies will be in tune with international standards? I'll give you um, an example. If anybody's arrested with pangolin in a state by Nezria, he's left off the hook because he's not involved in international trade. But pangolin is listed under CITES as not to be traded. Meanwhile, a smart lawyer will come and say, so he's just doing local transaction and gets off the hook with a slap on the wrist. So what can we do to our laws and to the system so that we can enforce and bring down anybody involved in wildlife crime? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Agbola. Uh, uh, Dr. Agbola happens to be my personal friend and colleague. We've worked together severally. Uh, his question is apt, and I have seen uh, that uh, evangelist Caroline Olori, the conservator of Cross River National Park, has her hands up. Perhaps when I'm done answering this question, she will also throw uh, some support. The truth is that there have been a lot of cases that people were supposed to be jailed. I, please permit me to mention just one. The case of Udoja, who went up Afi Mountain to kill gorillas with impunity and even set the mountain on fire to spite Kelly McFarlane and get her out of the mountain. Now, Udoja was arrested, taken to the court in Calabar, taken to the court in Eastern Nigeria, and even to a higher court in Abuja, at the end of the day, Udoja was set free for the absence of a law that will jail him for killing gorilla outside a protected area. So at the end of the day, Udoja went back to spite those who arrested him. This will always continue in Nigeria, except Government of Nigeria wakes up today and set up a tax force for wildlife conservation. This tax force will work in tandem with the National Park Service and the Nesria organization so as to propel the signs that will help the law to function. Many of the enforcement agency, for instance, NESRA that we are talking about, they don't have sufficient capacity to even identify which animal is endangered, which animal is on the CITES list. And if they know the name, can they identify the animal at the airport or on the street? They don't have this capacity. Under this type of situation, it needs a body of people properly selected on the merit of their capacity, passion, and commitment to conservation to form a national tax force that will work rigorously to bring people to the book. I have been extremely frustrated when I do clandestine surveys. I track a manatee, live manatee, pangolin, and I go up to the federal level to seek the arrest of such individuals and i get messed up at the end i give up so unless we have this kind of body waiting on nursery alone will never get us anywhere with the system current situation of corruption and all the likes we will not get somewhere please i leave the chance for evangelist kaloran alori to add a word or two. Really thank uh, Professor Enyang for this, I call this a very step for enlightening every other person. Yes, it is key. We, like he said, we in National Park, I'm here heading Cross River National Park. There is the law, there is enforcement, but there are limitations, there are challenges. 
We had like Cross River National Park, there are 105 communities surrounding the 4,000 square kilometers that the park is managing. There is a conservation education unit that constantly, continuously, enlightenment is a continuous process. So I agree with him totally that we need to continue enlightenment. Yes, yeah, there are laws and there are people kept on ground to at least enforce the laws. National Park Service, we have been doing a bit like he has said, but there is still more to be done. National Park Service is empowered to prosecute, especially the endangered species. When we arrest, there is a process of prosecution. But like he has said, there is need to empower more the agencies on ground. Nigeria has a set of laws they are working with and they are doing their best, but there is need for more to empower these agencies to go out there and do their best. We at the park level, we have emphasized and keep emphasizing meeting with communities because some communities tell you, look, you can't stop us if you like carry your guns and come and kill us. Now National Park, like he mentioned, is limited within the area that is designated a national park. What of the animals outside? So we have been doing more and more of engaging with the communities. And so I want to appreciate this particular issue that Profenia has brought forth. It's enlightening all of us. We have some organizations that are actually supporting the enforcement. And there is need for as many to come on board, knowing that if we don't take positive action, everybody, at the end, everything borders down to all of us, knowing that the wildlife we are seeing might not be there in the next 10 years. National Park and all the organizations need to put hands together, put to come together and ensure that, yes, with enlightenment, not just the communities, even our policymakers, we need to enlighten them like in that. our respective positions. So we have, I really say well done, Professor Nyang, for bringing this out to all of us that are participating. And I know that from this, what we are having today, there is a better news for wildlife out there. Thank you so much. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Professor Rina. Well, just from our side, also want to again say that we, sh we should encourage everybody who's on tonight to create awareness about the stalk and ask people to go into YouTube and watch the stalk. This is quite important. Uh, because that will also support the cause from a bigger and international perspective. Thank you, Professor. Ron, any other questions that you've noticed? Uh, professor uh, from Cepiso Lepera um, is asking, how many school children did you reach with this excellent work? And please share with us the results or impact of the environmental education programs. Thank you very much, Professor. Yes. Uh... Uh, from the year 2015 up till today, we have reached at least 16,350 school children. Hmm. Uh, uh, 72% of them have come to our education center to interact with our education officers and they've seen live animals, they've seen taxidermized species of animals that we get from the bushmeat markets. They've seen skeletons and all the likes. Today, we have programs that we go directly to the schools with our tortoise theater, which I lead the tortoise theater. We dance with animated tortoises, mascots, and then we take live tortoises rescued from the poach, poachers. We take them to children Christmas festivals organized by the television, Nigerian Television Authority. So at every opportunity, we do exhibitions of the wildlife of Nigeria, what we call beauty of nature in Nigeria. Another of that exhibition is coming up on the 22nd of May in the campus of the University of Uyo. We do the rallies for university campuses, and this is how we manage to hit 
high numbers of people. Some of them have become members. On our website, we have Conservation Club membership for people who are interested in joining us. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Enyang for a very fascinating presentation. I, I just want to contribute very briefly regarding uh, the awareness. I want to say that uh, uh, the informed people in the communities, the traditional rulers, the religious leaders should be more involved in the awareness campaign. Since a lot of people have lost confidence in government, the informed people in the society, in the communities, the opinion leaders and the religious leaders will help so much in the campaign, awareness campaign. So they should be actively involved in the awareness campaign. Thank you very much. I will make sure that uh, we involve you directly from your department as a member of the awareness group because you have a large number of students in your department and because you are in the extension program, I think you will be uh, very good in designing some of our education programs to community people. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, sir. Good evening all and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Prof, for putting this together. I came in a bit late, but then I don't have a question, but I have a contribution. You see, we have a problem with urbanization and uh, deforestation in some parts of Nigeria. And um, I have had the experience of seeing animals caught alive. And when these animals are caught, the people who are caught the animals don't know what to feed the animals. Maybe they have passion for animals. So that's the primary reason why they would have caught that animal alive. And then they don't know what to feed, to feed the animals. So I want to um, appeal to the prof that there should be some public awareness that if this kind of situation presents itself, they should look for a way to get the animals across to if they're a conservationist or maybe Professor Inyang himself to make sure that the animals are properly taken care of and then put in the right space. That's my contribution. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for attending this presentation. As you know, uh, the center was set up specifically to rescue animals. And as I told you in our last meeting, people have been coming up, bringing animals to the center. We have now set up a hotline for the center. People who see animals uh, stranded or illegally kept, they call the hotline. We come in and rescue the animal. The only problem we have is that we have no safe habitat to return these animals and be sure they will stay alive. Currently, we have animals that came in from the north of the country, then as it were, we don't even have sufficient space to keep them. Some of them are not, no longer are fit to go back to the jungle. So we leave them here as components of our education uh, program so that the children can see them with their eyes and appreciate what they are. I do appreciate your commitment to conservation, your publications that you have done showcasing our center and the work we were doing. I promise you, as soon as government is able to give us a space, we need space. So we can set up this mini sanctuary within the state capital. It will serve to enlighten more people from Aquaibom and also serve as a tourism, ecotourism uh, destination in our state, which has not even a zoo, nothing to enlighten people. So I thank you very much for your contribution.